NRK in Halagas, Kai Halagas in Prastanta An, Kai Thaas in Halagas. Were you edified? No. Were you taught anything? No. You didn't gain any knowledge or understanding of anything? No. Has it bettered your Christian life? No. You know what I just did? No. I spoke in an unknown tongue. Now, not in the way they're going to do this on TV. Uh, well, actually, in the way that... They will do this. We're going to use this as a good example. Benny Hinn will be a good example this morning. <laughs> Believe it or not, he will be. What I did was I spoke in an unknown tongue. It's unknown to you. It's, it's Koine Greek. And now let me do what the Bible would then demand of me and give you the interpretation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's John 1 and verse 1. Um, capital W being that of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the beginning. He is the creator of the universe. He is God manifest in the flesh. He bore your sins and my sins in his body on the cross of Calvary. And he's coming back again. Amen. Now, let me ask you a question. Now that you heard it in English, in a tongue that you can understand, have you been edified? Yeah. Perhaps encouraged. Maybe you haven't, but that would be a different spirit about you. But you understood, and because you understood, you gained some knowledge. Now, with that, this video, unfortunately, we're still in transition, so sorry you couldn't hear it. It would be more effective if you could have heard it. He said, how many do not speak English? And he used a translator to ask that question. The whole audience went up. He leaned over to the translator and said, okay, then I need you. This is extremely important in understanding. Go ahead and go to the PowerPoint presentation, brother. You can just close this out. This is going to be extremely important for our message today. Now, you know, here we are, Bible believers. We've got some visitors. Thank you for coming. And uh, um, we teach through the Bible. Okay, right now we're in 1 Corinthians for those who, have, uh, who are visiting our church. And we are just going to go through the Bible line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And sometimes that lends to us having a message that will be very inspirational and it will try to um, encourage you to live a better life for Christ. Last four weeks we studied charity. Very inspirational, less doctrinal, spiritual in application. Today, we are now transitioning back into our study in Corinthians in regards to the speaking in unknown tongues. Well, I could ignore all that or I could teach you something this morning. And so what I'm going to do um, is, is revisit a message and just with some tweaks that we did back in 2011. If you remember, we studied the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And when you get to the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, there is uh, some tongue speaking, unknown tongues. This is the first time that it happens in the scripture. And we are now going to let it determine to us and dictate to us what our doctrine should be in regards to the matter of speaking in tongues. How is it pertinent to this church? There's not anybody here that I know of that's running around speaking in, in an unknown language. But it's very pertinent to us because the majority of the church, and I speak the church, not this church, the church, believes incorrectly in regards to this matter of the doctrine of unknown tongues, if you will. So, we are going to be in Acts chapter 2. Go ahead and flip over there. We are not going to be in 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to be in Acts chapter 1 or 2. We are introducing 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and then use it to springboard then. So again, at, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here are a bunch of gifts that God has given to the body of Christ. Why? Why did he give gifts to the body of Christ? Edify. To edify the saints, to build you up on your most holy faith. And then he reminds you in the 13th chapter what this is supposed to be about. Charity. Caring about you more than I care about me. So that you don't abuse these gifts, hurt other people with these gifts, and bring 
all kinds of glory to yourself in the process. Look at how gifted I am. And then he moves on to the 14th chapter, which then says, okay, so now that we've talked about what gifts there are, how you should use them, let's talk about the administration. Let's talk about the rules that are going to govern all of these, these gifts. And so we will get to that. We're going to break that down. But I need to teach you what is an unknown tongue. What is that gift? What did it have to do with the body of Christ? Does it have anything to do with us today? So here we are, right? And we need to pray. I'm going to ask Pastor Joe to open us up in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, as always, it's just good to be here in church this morning, Lord. We just pray uh, that you're with uh, Pastor Seth to deliver this message, Lord. I ask your blessing on him. Thank you for his study. Lord, I just pray that uh, you speak to all of us here. Mm -hmm. Lord, today, even though it's a teaching, Lord, I pray that it pricks our heart where it needs to be yes. uh, done so. So, Lord, we just give you all the glory and honor and praise, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so we're in Acts chapter 2 now. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. We're just going to start breaking these things down, and I'm going to show you what the Word of God has to say about the first time the speaking in unknown tongues business shows up. Verses 1 and 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So now for today, we're not going to bother to talk about the Feast of Pentecost and what was going on there. We can we skip right down. When we get to verses on it, we're going to skip that matter altogether. But the feast day had fully come upon the people of Israel. And that began in the evening, carried over into the morning. People were gathered to celebrate that feast, including a number of Jewish people who did not live in Israel. They came to visit for that feast with a very specific reason in mind, to celebrate the Lord, to celebrate their Jewish heritage. It's going to be important. We're going to revisit that. Now, I have heard, and um, we're going to have issues with this because we're running low on the batteries here. All right, I don't care about that. I have heard uh, real testimonies. Does that, anyone know where my past is? I am a former charismatic. I don't even know what a charismatic is. Uh, someone who uh, uh, believes mainly that the gifts and these miracles and these signs and these wonders are still in operation today. There's nothing wrong with being charismatic in your faith. Nothing wrong with that. Be zealous. Be excited about what the Lord has done for you. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ with great zeal. That we need to learn some things from a charismatic. Because we can get kind of stiff in a Baptist church, let's be honest. All right? But I can't learn doctrine very well from them. I can learn to be encouraged. And, you know, I mean, they're just, get up and go, man. Get up and go. Amen. That's good. I appreciate that. I can't have you dictating doctrine to me because you really don't understand it, though. Yeah. So I've heard testimonies of charismatics, and the reason I've heard those testimonies is because I've been in their presence with them, and I've prayed with them, and I've been at the altars with them, and I've served for two years in, in a charismatic church that's not far from here, right around the corner, really. Um, and I've been in these prayer meetings um, where they start talking to me about their experience of their Holy Ghost experience and how the doors blew open and the wind came rushing in and they were stunned and then they began to just with one accord blah 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 start speaking okay I've heard this and I'm, th I'm thinking at the time wow that's pretty cool I want that to happen to me right because I don't want to miss out on something God's doing right this is the cell this is the cell, because I don't want to be someone who kicks a God, aside God's power and his moving in my life. So I get it. This isn't me beating on anyone. This is me telling you I've got experience on both sides of the aisle. And I got the book. All right? If, if, if that matters. So my question to anybody, charismatics, Catholics, Baptists, 
Pentecostals, Presbyterians, Lutherans would be, always be this. Can we not let this book tell us what to believe? Amen. Does it always have to be our opinions and our feelings on a matter? Shouldn't it be what God said? Amen. Okay, well, if we can agree on that, then we can get someplace today. Amen. We need to get someplace today. Number one in this meeting that's going on in Acts, there's no mention of a prayer meeting here. They're not here gathering together asking for the Holy Ghost to descend upon them. That's not what's happening here. What were they doing? What Jesus told them to do. Wait. So they waited. Number two, nobody was asking for a gift of tongues. You say, well, why do you say it? Because of the testimony that I hear from my brothers and sisters in a charismatic church. That we were here, we were asking for the Spirit to give us the gift of tongues. Why? They weren't. Why are you asking for something that God didn't ask you to ask for? They were waiting. Listen, folks, the apostles didn't even know what they were waiting for. Let's just be honest. I mean, have you heard Peter preach in Acts chapter 2? He couldn't give the gospel of Jesus Christ to save his life in that, in that chapter. He's telling you John's baptism in that chapter. He's like, I know I went through this and Jesus said this and we've got to repent from my, our idolatry and we've got to be water baptized and, and this is my experience and I don't know anything. Heads, tails, up, down, left or right. I'm just telling you this is what I believe. And Jesus said, stop. Wait. Wait. Okay? Number three. There wasn't actually wind blowing through the place. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic. This is the truth. Be again, based on these testimonies, oh, the doors opened, the wind blew in. I know where you're getting that. You're getting that from the text, but you're not reading the text. What does the text say? Well, somebody please read. What is... And so, verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. So what happened? What filled the place? Noise. Oh, the wind blew open. Listen, all right, you're being dramatic. <laughs> Let's just call a spade a spade. You're, you're being a little dramatic here. And I get it because we're such an experiential body of people. Everything is our experience and we want to experience things. Um, so I'll share with you my experience in receiving the Holy Ghost. I'm going to share with you my experience in receiving the Holy Ghost as it was taught to me by my charismatic friends. And then I'm going to share it with you as it actually happened. Now, when I was in the charismatic church and I wanted to speak in tongues and everybody kept running up to me asking me if I had received the second blessing and if I had been filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm green, right? And going, I don't know what you're talking about, but yeah, let's do it. I want that, you know? Because you can say a lot of bad things about me, but here's what you can't say, that I am not zealous for the Lord. So if God had something, I want it. If this is legitimate, I want it. So they said, okay, well, we're going to have a meeting. We're going to have a prayer meeting. And Pastor, whatever her name was, <laughs> can I stop for a moment and just say, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also say at the law, 1 Corinthians 14, 34. So when it comes to teaching men, not Bible, not for a woman. There aren't women pastors, they're hymns, they're not hers. I'm sorry if you don't like that. It's certainly not, it's not looked at fondly in 21st century America. But God's not a 21st century American. Amen. Amen. So he set the order up as such. And so, pastor so-and-so... Um, let everybody, all these people into a big room and 
she stood in the middle and we all were told to gather in a circle and hold hands, very kumbaya, and a um, little uncomfortable for most men. Yeah. Let's be honest. Most men would be like, oh, yeah, I don't know who you are and I don't know who you are and I don't really like holding hands with you, dude, but <laughs> I'm following the pastoress. <laughs> so, <laughs> and she said, okay, I'm just going to start speaking in tongues. And we're all looking at each other like, ooh, this ought to be good. Cool. All right. <laughs> and she's like, and just when you grab onto some words, just copy me. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, right away there was, God's kind of put this bell in me, this buzzer and this whistle in me that I can kind of just, I don't know when something ain't jiving. And even with being as green as I was, I'm like, okay, this is weird. So, but, so I'm just, that's not what I read, but okay, okay. The, the pastor S knows more than I do about the scripture, I'm going to assume, because I'm new to this. Um, and so we all began to just mimic her, and before you knew it, the whole place, and I'm holding the hands and I'm trying to get stuff out, nothing coming out. I'm trying. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with me? God has rejected me. And, I mean, it was hard. It was hard because I wanted this. You know, and, and everyone's jumping and they're, jump, they're running out of the room and they're praying in tongues and everyone's excited. And, I'm, and I'm, my head's kind of down and I'm walking. I'm one of the last guys out and there's one other guy. That's my brother right there. He was like, <laughs> he's walking out the door. I said, Anything happen to you? It's like, no. Oh. <laughs> like, me either. But we both went away thinking something wrong with us. There was something right with us. We weren't willing to lie to ourselves. So, you know, here we are <laughs> many years later. And no, I'm, not, I'm still not speaking in tongues and can't. Um, well, I can. I can speak in the English tongue and a little bit of Greek, as you heard when we first started. Now, how did I really receive the Holy Ghost? Well, when I was six years old, my mother gave me the gospel of Jesus Christ. She sat me down on her lap and she told me that Jesus died for my sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day and the third night and that I would put my trust in him as a six-year-old child, as a sinning six-year-old child, if I would put my trust in his righteousness, that he would save me. And in that day, I was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's... That's the spirit, uh, that's the baptism of the Spirit of God, according to the scriptures. You say, well, how do you know that? How, why isn't it something else? Because the Bible says that if I don't have the Spirit of God, Romans 8 and verse 9, that I am none of His. That's right. That's right. Go ahead and look at it. Romans 8 9. If you want, take the time. You can take a look at it. You can believe me if you want. He said, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. So how can I be saved and then ask for the Spirit to fill me? Either I have the Spirit and I'm His, or I don't have the Spirit and I'm not His. But according to the Bible, if that matters, I'm His when I trust Him and He gives me His Spirit. Okay? So far, so good. Haven't lost you? By the way, buckle in. <laughs> Relax. Put your feet up. You've had like 30-minute messages for like five weeks now. Not today. Amen. <laughs> there we go. Verses 3. <laughs> the old pastor's back. Verses 3 and 4. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, see the word cloven in verse 3? What does it mean? By the way, the charismatic church that I attended was, I don't want to say King James only by any stretch of the imagination, but that was their official book. So this word cloven was there. Now he would cross it off and tell you to correct it, but that's a different matter altogether. What does it mean? It's the past participle of the word cleave, which actually is a contronym. What's a contronym? Well, it's a word that is the same word, but has the complete opposing meanings. 
To cleave is to separate. And to cleave is to come together. It means the same. It's like let in your King James Bible. Let means to allow. Let also means to disallow. Say, so, well, well, these are tough words. Well, welcome to the English language. Yeah. Right? English is a very difficult language. It really is. And, I th and Greek is tough enough. Believe me, I hated that. Uh, I had to take Greek. Um, but, you know, you're, good, you're better off learning a language when you're young. And that's why little kids can learn multiple languages. They're just, their brains can soak it up. Old people get stuck in their ways. Yeah. So, but that's, that's, the, that's the word there. That's what cleave means. It's a, it's a contronym. So, with that in mind, what's happening in the text? Tongues, whatever they looked like. You don't know. I don't know. I know what this one looks like, and I'm not going to stick it out at you. But I don't know what it looked like when they came down and people were looking at them. I don't know. Nobody does. Nobody can tell you. But it was one tongue that entered the room, great noise, and as it arrived, it clove, or cleaved. It broke apart and descended upon each person and it rested upon the people. It was visible. By the way, in the meeting that I was in, there was nothing visible, except for a bunch of kumbaya people hoping for the best. Right? So... By the way, very much, very much how spiritual gifts have been administered. One spirit. Right? Even as you're called in one hope of your calling, there's one spirit of God. And what does he do? He takes gifts. You, 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 you. And somebody goes, wait a minute, you're passing me by. You're not ready for that yet. Severally, severally as he will. That's, that's how the Spirit administers. But it's one Spirit, and then he divvies it all out as, as he wills. And, and it appeared unto them, it says in the text. Well, now we have to answer the question, which of them? Yeah. Everyone present? Who's present? Is it just the apostles? Does it include the disciples who aren't apostles, by the way? The apostles were disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, but I am not an apostle, and none of you are. And none of you can be, because none of you were a part of John the Baptist's ministry. None of you saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. Those are the prerequisites in the scripture, if that matters to you. Yeah. To some people, it doesn't. That's why people run around going, I'm apostle so-and-so. And I'm thinking, apostle, please read. Because you can't be an apostle. So now, which of them? Look at Acts 2 and verse 7. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? God's given you a hint as to what's going on. So who's speaking now in tongues? Galileans. Well, who's that? Okay, well, let's go to Mark. Mark chapter 1. Keep your place here. So we got Bible study this morning instead of, you know, Amen. instead of just preaching. It's let's let the Bible teach us something this morning. Amen. And I love good preaching. Amen. But we need good teaching too. Amen. Mark 1 and verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of where? Galilee. So a Galilean, right? He was baptized of, Jordan, uh, baptized of John in Jordan. Look at verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Okay, so he went into Galilee before he picked out disciples and apostles. Verses 16 through 21. So now we know what region he's in. Now as we walked by the sea of 
Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Capernaum, where's that? It's in the region of Galilee. Verse 28, and immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Now, we know that from the scriptures that Jesus had disciples from other parts of Israel, eventually as his public ministry was made, you know, made known, people from all over, including in the area of Beth Bethlehem and Judea, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they would all become his disciples as well. But when Jesus began his ministry, he began it in his home region, Galilee being like Erie County. And then he'd go town to town to town and begin to preach in Erie County, and he started making disciples who he ordained as what? Apostles. Apostles. They were all called out of Galilee, every one of them. Let's confirm it with another verse. Look back at Acts 2 and verse 14. Acts 2.14. But Peter, standing up with the 11, 11 who? Where were they all from? So who was speaking in tongues? The apostles. The 12 apostles, which would now include Matthias, rather than Judas, who fell by transgression, he hanged himself and he was done. Say, so why is this important? Who cares who was speaking? It's extremely important. These were apostolic signs. Only the apostles had this ability. Now, there are more than just 12 apostles. But we're not going to get into that for today. There were more at that time who were partakers of John the Baptist's ministry. Paul was an apostle. Paul is not in this group. So there are other apostles. They just had to meet the requirements. So, but in this time, it was the 12 apostles. You got history in front of you. Verse 4 is key. Where am I here? And uh, we need to get to, back to Acts. I need to get back to Acts. Um, verse 4. I could turn here in my notes too, but... They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Very important. Historically, this is the first time that this has ever happened. It's something brand new that the Lord was doing within the body of believers, within the church. It's the fulfillment of His promise. What was his promise? Again, this is a long message, so I'm going to do a lot of reading of Scripture for you, too. If you want to turn to John 14, you'd be going back and forth. But John 14, verses 16 and 17 say this, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that, ye, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Who's the Comforter, capital C? Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Not only comfort and truth, but power, according to Acts 1 and verse 8. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. These men had some power. Amen. Anyone here able to raise the dead? Well, now why is it that some claim to be able to speak in unknown tongues and if I were to ask any of them if they can raise the dead, the answer quickly is, well, no, I can't do that. Right. Well, now that's curious. Why not? Why did you get one apostolic sign and not the other? Pick up a serpent. Why don't we try with that one? <laughs> Pick up a venomous serpent. Let it bite you. You won't die if you have these apostolic signs. Anyone willing to take that? 
No? Nobody? Why not? Because it's not happening now. And you know it. And you know it. So what are they doing on these what are they doing on the television, on the Christian television? Fleecing you. That's right. Here you go, Benny. Man, oh man. Here's a ten. Here's a five. I've got much more beyond that, a couple singles. <laughs> yes. Go, Benny. You're going to have the last bit I got. You know why? Because I want what you have, and, and you got these sign gifts, and, and I really want these sign gifts, and you're telling me that I'm not right with God, or I'd have these sign gifts, and you're also telling me that if I would just give to your ministry, then God would bless me, and I would have the hundredfold blessing, and, and, and all these gifts would be good. i got to plant my seed. i got to plant my seed. I'm scared now. That is no different than what a Roman Catholic Pope did in the Dark Ages. You want to go to heaven? Right. Fleece in the sheep. It's a shame. Why are, the, why are the sheep so willing to be fleeced? Fear is a great motivator. So here's what you can't do. You can't go to the book of the Acts of the Apostles. That's the full title and say these are the acts of the believers. It's not. It's the acts of the apostles, full title. And you know what else you can't do is you can't go to an historical book and pull your doctrine out of it. Can't do it. This was their first time encounter. The book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, it's filled with differing accounts of the same baptism. So which one do you want to pick then? You don't pick any of them because it's not your doctrine. That's right. That's good. It's just history. This is what God was doing in a matter of years. And by the time Paul began to pen Romans to Philemon, then he's going to tell you some of what you need to do. But for then it was, oh, listen, here's an example. Acts 8, 17. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. So laying on of hands, no tongues to follow at all, which is different from Acts 2 encounter where there's tongues but there's no laying on of hands. Acts 19 and verse 6. Go ahead, look. Just take the preacher's word. The word of God tell you, this, this, I'm speaking the truth here. Verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Well, now we, what we have is, Laying on, of t t uh, or laying on of hands and tongues to follow, which disagrees with the other two. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I hope, I, maybe, if you're new to the Bible, this might be very confusing, and my apologies to you. Just trying to clear up that that stuff you see on TV, people going blah, 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 that it's not what actually happened here. Okay, we're getting there. I'm just laying a foundation. Then, if you read, by the way, in Acts chapter 8, there's this Ethiopian eunuch. And he's sitting in a chariot. And Philip the evangelist is told by the Holy Spirit of God, go join yourself up with this person. What am I going to do? Well, you're going to go preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's reading in the book of Isaiah. He's reading the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, maybe one of the greatest prophetical references to the death of and uh, uh, the punishment of Jesus Christ in his body for your sins and mine. Amen. And the Ethiopian eunuch is reading it and he doesn't understand it. And so Philip the evangelist comes up and he begins to preach unto him Christ. Jesus. Amen. The Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. He believes on the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation. He says, hey, what hinders me to be baptized? And Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He gets down into the water, comes back up. Philip's gone. Where'd Philip go? It's gone. Ethiopian opian eunuch, running up and down, excited, saved, probably brought the gospel of Jesus Christ back with them, unlike modern Christians. And no tongues. No reference of laying out of any hands, nothing. 
Why? What's an Ethiopian? A Gentile. Who was Philip? Paul. Peter. James. John. Jewish apostles. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. The Jews require a sign. That is how God established it. So always in the midst of unbelieving Jews, these wonders began to appear. <coughs> To a Gentile? Nah. Right. Why? What do the Gentiles seek after? Wisdom. 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 Same verse. Yep. Yep. We're all about the edumacation. Oh. I'm smarter than you. I got letters after my name. Went to school for eight years. Changed my major 12 times. Ha <laughs> 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 ha Right. <laughs> And I didn't even intend that. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is what we're about, right? This is what we're about. Um, Acts is history. Acts is history. It's what happened. Sometimes how it happened. It's not why it happened. For that, you need Romans through Philemon. And everything that happened, even with Paul present, he will then, by the Spirit of God, teach us how to employ in our lives. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about. Wait a minute, you guys aren't understanding this thing about tongues. Let me explain it. And we're still not. The first and key reason for the gift of the Holy Ghost express, expressed here in the text back in Acts 2, is to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It's like Ezekiel 11.5, And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. That's inspiration, if you will. Inspiration to speak God's words in a supernatural way. Right now, I am called as a pastor to speak God's word. There's nothing supernatural about it. You know, I'm not in some prayer closet in the morning getting zapped by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I pray in the morning. I go over my sermon. It's very, logis very logical. It's very, okay, okay, yeah, this verse good. No, I don't like what I said here. You know, that's, it's nothing mystical here. Um, Jesus said that ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. The Spirit fills, the mouth speaks. Speaks what? Gibberish? Something no one in this room will understand? Really? Is that why God gave you the gift? So that you could understand something and no one else? That's what's taught. Verse 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Key verse as well. Because again, the Jews require a sign, right? So who's present here? Jews, devout Jews. Under, but from where? Every nation under heaven. See, the, the Jews have been a wandering people since Babylon. Actually, before that, since Egypt. But even when they, after they got dispersed into Babylon, a lot of them remained in different sections of the world and never came back, though God told them to come back. So all over the world, there were Jews spread out. They still are today. And they're very cultural. Very into their culture. This isn't a negative thing in any way, shape, or form. This is just fact. And some of us are very cultural. Mr. Horik in the back. Horik is very, very German. <laughs> Loves, talks about, I'm German. Okay, all right. I'm German, Koenig. Koenig. That's the German way of saying it. I got to spit when I say it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't spit far. It just goes right here. It just holds the, the notes down. Okay, so if I was very interested in my German heritage, which I couldn't care less about, I'm born again, so I don't care. But if, if I was very interested in my German heritage, 
and wanted to go back to mother Germany and learn from Germans about my ancestry. I could do that, I'd get on a plane, I'd go there, maybe during one of their, you know, Oktoberfests, instead of the Feast of Pentecost, to go during Oktoberfest. Go learn about their heritage. You know what they're going to have to do for me? They're going to have to speak English or I won't understand anything. That's the plain truth. Well, there were Jews nationally, or Jews by nationality, living under every nation under the tongue, or under the, under the world, who spoke what language? Apparently not Hebrew. What did they speak? Well, it's listed. It's listed in the verse, which we'll get to. So, Jesus... Why, why on this day of Pentecost? Because Jesus wanted these Jews who would be present, who would go back out into all the world, to be witness of something extraordinary. Now let me ask you, what is it that they witnessed that was so extraordinary? Was it people speaking in tongues? That was the miracle, but what did they bring with them? They brought the wondrous works of God with them. God is doing something in Israel. Now again, the gospel of Jesus Christ wasn't fully understood at the time. What they brought with them was that there's this Jesus. He was in Jerusalem. They say he's the son of God. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. They say he rose from the dead. What are we going to do with this guy? It's a good question. What will you do with him? Because your soul hangs in the balance. That's why God dispersed this thing out. Verses 6 and 7. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. That's not gibberish. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Why are you... Sp I thought you were a Jew. You're talking German. I thought you were a Jew. Ju this guy's... This guy's Pedro over here, he speaks Spanish. He's understanding you. This guy speaks French. He understands. What is going on? And not a single one of these apostles knew how to speak English or French or German. This was the miracle that was upon them, the tongues that they spoke. They were able to just, by the miracle of God, speak in a language that they did not know. That's why it's unknown tongues not to the hearer to the speaker and this is the confusion I don't know what I'm saying but I'm saying it and you understand it that's a miracle that's a miracle and that's what happened here in Acts how about that now is that what you've been taught I can say as a former charismatic that's not what I was taught a tongue is a what? Language. It's a language. And folks, it's not the heavenly prayer language. What's the heavenly prayer language? That is the language that people say that they're, they're praying in when they speak in tongues. This is a charismatic doctrine. They go, well, okay, everybody, everybody pray in your prayer language. And everyone starts going, and everybody's doing something different. And it's a cacophony of noise. You say, that's not what they do. That is what they do. I was there for two years. Yeah. It's exactly what they do. Okay, well, I'm just speaking in my heavenly prayer language. Okay, well, that's great. Doesn't do much earthly good. Why do you do it? Well, I do it because 1 Corinthians 13. Go ahead and look at it. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Well, this isn't the why. This is, this is proof that I can speak in a pro heavenly prayer language. I speak in the language of angels. 
1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So this is what a charismatic brings me to this verse and says, see, there's, you can speak in the language of men and you can speak in the language of angels. Now, quite frankly, I used to defend the general Baptist shtick that what this means here is that it's one language spoken by both men and angels. But that's really not what it says. Let's, so, I mean, I, the Bible can teach me, right? Amen. Let's let the Word of God speak and let's just note the English. The word is not tongue, singular, but tongues, plural, of men and of angels. So there's two languages here. Yeah. Now, I don't know that I can defend the Baptist line of their think, uh, there being no difference between man's tongue and an angel's tongue, not honestly anyhow, but let's note something. Where in this verse or any other verse of scripture does it state that a man will be able to speak with an angel's tongue? Is that what it says here? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. What's the point of the text? Charity. Charity. Doesn't matter. Then it goes on to later say, though I could remove mountains with my faith. Anyone here moving mountains? Any charismatic on TV moving mountains around? No. Why? This is theoretical, rhetorical. The Lord is just, he's making a point. I don't care how gifted you are, if you don't have charity, it means nothing. So you can take all those gifts and stop bragging and just get down on your knees and how about you minister to somebody? How about you show a little compassion to somebody? How about you show a little love? How about you care enough about their souls to actually give them the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's interesting. Because they're going to bring you to this verse and they're going to bring you to 1 Corinthians 14.4. Go ahead and look at that to defend their speaking in gibberish even though their gibberish sounds different from the next guy's gibberish. Wait a minute, I thought you were speaking in a heavenly prayer language. Well, I am. So you're speaking in the tongue of angels. Well, yeah. Well, we, the angels all speak different languages? Well, no, but this is my heaven. This is my prayer language. Why you? Why do you get your own language? What's the point of you having your own language? Language is meant so that you can communicate. <coughs> what happened in Babylon? A world that did not want to know God. God confused their languages so that they couldn't do what? Communicate one with another. So you're saying God reversed it? You're saying he turned that thing into a blessing? So you speak your own language. Why? So that you and God can communicate. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, right? Anyone here is French an unknown tongue to you? It's an unknown tongue to me. I know of it, but I don't know it. Okay? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. See, I'm just trying to edify myself. Oh, I'm just, I, I need some edification right now. Oh, that's wonderful. Except for you missed the point of the whole chapter. You're not to be charitable to you. You're not to edify you. That's why 1 Corinthians 13 is snuck in between. Charity edifieth 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1. Yep. So I'm just trying to, I'm edifying myself. No, 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 you miss it. Charity seeketh not her own. You're missing it. This is sarcasm. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 is sarcasm. You're just running around, you're just running around edifying yourself. Wrong! Didn't you read the last chapter? Yeah. Oh, see now, it begins to make a little more sense now, doesn't it? Yeah. This isn't 
saying, speak in a tongue to edify yourself. This is saying, shame on you. You got this wrong. Why are you so selfish? See, now, this is, this is the issue. This is the modern church issue. What does the church do for me? As if the church is a separate entity. Yeah. Yeah. What is the church, this building, this place, and all the people that are coming, what does it do for me? Rather than, I'm the church. What do I bring to the assembly to do for you? Amen. That is the point. Otherwise, why do we assemble? Do we, I mean, do we just assemble to sing songs? What are we here for? We got to get out of this mentality that we go to church. You are the church. Be the church. The other verse they run to is Romans 8.26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So I've heard this verse explained to me that, see, this is when you don't know what to pray for, man, you just start in your heavenly prayer language and the, and, and the Holy Ghost goes before God. Mm, well, that's, that's quite interesting here. Hmm. Can you read? What are the last four words of the verse? If, if you're at Romans 8.26, what are the last four words of the verse? Nice and loud, somebody, one person, not a cacophony of, of tongues. Which cannot be uttered. So if the Spirit now is doing some sort of miracle here, he's, come, he's, he's giving you the gift to pray with something that cannot be... This isn't speaking in tongues. This is not talking. Go back to Acts 2 and look at verse 4. And I want to ask you what's happening here because look at the last four, verse, or four words of this verse. Someone. Spirit gave them utterance. Gave them utterance. So the gift of tongues that fell upon them caused them to utter. What's happening in Romans 8.26 causes them to stop uttering. Why? Because we don't know how to pray. Sometimes, listen, sometimes we go through some stuff. We just, we just go through some things. Many of you have gone through some things in life. And I am so at the end of myself right now, and I am so at the end of my rope. I'm praying, but at this point... I just sit. I got nothing. I don't know what to ask for. I've been praying this way for the last six months. Nothing's changed. Life is continuing to treat me like Job. I don't know how to get past this. I don't know how to feel about this. And if you're saved, here's the wonderful promise that God has offered you. That the spirit that now abides in you will go before the throne of God with prayers that you can't utter and he will interpret your inner groaning and your pain and your sorrow. He will interpret that in a way that God the Father wants to hear so he'll answer it. Now, where we get confused is that because I just spent the last six months praying for A, B, and C, and D's been happening. Well, here's the problem is that the Spirit may have gone before the throne of God the Father, and they may have agreed to give you D and not A, B, and C that you've been praying for. But if you will receive it, there's a blessing in it. You've just got to get to the other side of Galilee. 
This life is the Sea of Galilee. Get in the boat with Jesus, and it's going to be some rocky waves until you get to the other side of the shore. But if you don't get in with Jesus, you got no one to save you. 8, 9, and 10, and 11. Preacher, we want to go home. You will. <laughs> I'm just making up for the last four weeks. Verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. We don't normally go this long, but there's a lot here. Uh, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? What was that? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Amen. What do you have a list here, a list of... 16 languages, 1611, by the way, ends in verse 11, just curiously, um, of tongues that the Holy Ghost put within the lips of the apostles, m making this thing what should be as obvious as the day is long. What happened here was not a bunch of gibberish, and there was no heavenly language. These were earthly languages. For what purpose? The declaration of the wonderful works of God to people who would not understand it in Hebrew. Not for the edification of self, because they could have sat in a room by themselves and spake in some sort of language, but they did so publicly in the language of the hearer without them knowing the language. That's tongues. That's unknown tongues. That's that gift, biblically. Verses 12 and 13, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are filled with new wine. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. Great questions asked in verse 12. What meaneth this? Indeed, people still can't tell you what it means. What is God's intention in all of this? That the word of God would be spread throughout the world. That, the people, that people would get saved. Amen. This, folks, this is the purpose of this church. We're singing an old rugged cross. Why? So that we can just celebrate it? Or so that we can tell someone about it? I'm going to now go to English speakers and I'm going to share the wonderful works of God and what he's done for my life. Amen. And I want to let you English speakers know that Jesus Christ took a wretched, miserable sinner like this man, Amen. picked me up out of the filth Amen. and the mire and the muck of my sin and my wretched heart Amen. and he hosed me off in the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me, gave me everlasting life as a free gift. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Don't perish, but have everlasting life. He wanted to give me a free gift. Well, how do you receive a gift? Brother, can I have that handbook, please? Just like that. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. He had the power to pass the hymn book. I asked him to do so. He did it. I do not have the power to, to get myself into heaven. Right. Can't do it. N neither can you. And God is holy, and he's not just letting any old schmo come into heaven. If you notice the, the, the man in the parable, he didn't go into the pig slop with his prodigal child. He stayed home. He stayed clean. Amen. And when his son came to the end of himself and said, this is not the life I want. Mm -hmm. He repented. He headed back to the father and the father saw him a far way off and ran to him. Amen. But never once did the father go into the pig slop. He waited for the son to come to himself. Amen. And that's what the Lord is waiting for each and every one of us to do. Come to the end of ourselves and realize, wait a minute, I am living a life of sin. My sin has consequences. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ Amen. our Lord. Amen. It's a gift. Well, again, how do I receive a gift? Lord, can I have that? Yeah. Yes, you may. Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. Do you want some money for it? Bite your tongue. Right. That's not, if you've got to buy it, it's not a gift. It's a purchase. And he would be offended by that. Because he did it for you. He purchased for you. With his blood. Your redemption. Well, what if I don't? Well, then you go to hell. That's it. Wait a minute. God would send me to hell? No, you chose that. It's your choice. You have two choices. Heaven or hell. Heaven. Okay, well here's how. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Can't be that simple. Why would God make it hard if he wants you to be saved? Amen, brother. How about that? We've come a long way. These guys mocking them. They're filled with new wine. Yeah, what's new wine? Grape juice. <laughs> Even, oh, my poor charismatic friends. This is not about being drunk in the Holy Ghost. Mockers came in and said, these guys are drunk on grape juice. It's complete mockery. Yeah, right. No one was drunk on anything. A miracle happened and they just doubted it. Listen, I just preached the gospel for the last five minutes. Okay, you're going to come at this thing I don't know how you're going to come at it. I need, to, I need to close. I need to close. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share this illustration with you. And then we, we got to go. I taught the boys this week um, that sometimes things that appear bad for you are good for you. And I used the example of apple cider vinegar. And I poured some into a little cup. <laughs> and I walked it up to all three of the boys. Caleb picked it up. <laughs> said, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. You don't want to try it? No. Lucas picked it up. Went, okay, I'll try it. And he drank it. <laughs> and he went, not bad. <laughs> and then we gave it to Gabriel. Put it in his nose. He went, Ooh! He literally gagged. Literally gagged. And I went, this is the perfect illustration to the response that people give to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here, I'm preaching the gospel. Maybe you're one that's... Now, Caleb tasted it, by the way. He eventually partook. It took him a little time. It had to work its way around the table eventually. So he's the, he's the one that's a little skeptical, but I'm interested I'm willing to try. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can trust this Jesus. I don't know. I don't know. And eventually he did. Lucas? Well, if this is what it's going to take to be healthy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Receive the gospel right away. Amen. If this is what it's going to take. But I, I gotta, I'm getting out. I want to be healthy. I want to get out of hell. Amen. Bring it on, Jesus. Gabriel? <laughs> You guys are crazy. <laughs> Preaching that gospel. Jesus this, Jesus that. There you are with your street signs and your oh look at look at your car. He's got oh Jesus on the car. Oh everybody's a Tim Tebow. Let's take a knee. It's like this is stuff. It's just enough, enough, enough of your religion. It's not religion. And if you have a disdain for it, you have shed or you have Tread underfoot the blood of the Son of God. And there is no forgiveness of sins. But if you will receive it, I don't care if you come at it a little skeptically at first and then eventually drink, or if you just go, man, oh man, I want salvation. You need it. Don't be my other son. <laughs> and that one is the spiritual one. All right. We need, to, we need to go our separate ways. Hopefully. Thank you for your patience. Father, thank you, Lord God, for giving us.